It's such a pleasure to get to be here. My name is Natalie Cartwright, and I run a startup out of Canada that's called Finn. What we do is we build virtual financial assistance for banks. Uh, so they take our product, and they put their label on it, and they push it out to their customers. And it's been really exciting to get to be here and to hear some growing consensus around the area that I'm really most interested in, which is tech governance and AI governance, since we use a lot of AI in our product. And uh, at the risk of being indulgent, I'd like to talk a little bit about my company and how we grew it, because I think it's a really good example of what's happening with companies like mine all around the world and has some really big policy implications as well. So let me tell you about how we actually started uh, the company. I actually used to work for UN organizations and an organization called the Global Fund, so my background is in a very different world than technology. And I realized that if technology or if international development was going to improve, it needed a stronger business perspective. So I went to do an MBA, and afterwards, uh, one of my friends, who was a management consultant in the program, called me and said, um, Natalie, do you want to do something in fintech? So while we were still on the phone, I googled fintech, which I can now, with confidence, tell you stands for financial technology. And I said to him, sure, if you want to move to Canada, I'll create a business with you. So when we're talking about uh, the next generation and, and doing technology and doing jobs that didn't formally exist, I am that next generation. I don't really, when I first started at least, did not know nearly uh, enough about technology. And most of the people that I hire on my team have not been formally trained in technology necessarily. We've got PhDs in data science and other pieces, but lots of masters in geography, other types of pieces. So we've heard um, that this has really big policy implications for education. And I just wanted to share with you three of the things that I see as really fundamental to incorporating in our education as we go forward. So the first thing that we look for is we look for people who have an ability to code or to understand coding language. And it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone needs to be a developer and writing code, but it is the basis of our technology language and should be something that every child understands. The second thing that I look for in my team is people who know how to learn. And it's not just that they know how to learn, but they have to be able to learn independently and teach themselves. So whether that's going to the internet or asking a friend or reading a book, I don't really care how they learn, but they're always trying to improve themselves and take on new challenges. And the third thing that's really important for people uh, on my team with their skill set is that they have to be failure resistant. Uh, when we're building technology, we don't build projects from zero to 100. We build them in these very small incremental steps. But often, when you reach one step, you don't solve it the first time. And often it's not the second time. And often it's not the third time. It could be the 50th or the 100th time that you approach a problem before you actually solve it. But that means that I need people on my team to be able to fail repeatedly, pick themselves back up, and continue to keep going. So for people who are involved in educational policy, those are the three things that I think we should be looking at going forward. It was three years ago that we started our, com our company. Today we're about 40 people. We're hiring five to 10 people uh, every month. We've been able to attract quite a few banks, which has been fantastic. We work across four continents. We work with one of the 10 largest banks in the world. And um, I just want to give you an idea of the scale at which my company, which is really just 40 people, relatively small, is working at. So just through one of our customers, which is our largest customer, we'll be rolled out to 20 million people over the next three to four years. And I don't say that because it's um, exceptional. I actually say that because I think it's entirely unexceptional. We know that there's some big players who are creating AI. Everyone talks about them. But I think that companies like mine, of which there are thousands around the world, are also rolling things out at scale. And the implication from a policy perspective is that we don't have the luxury of time. We have to figure out how we move quickly, because there's companies who are building and scaling and really don't have a lot of frameworks to work within. And I think one of the solutions for that problem can be borrowing one of the playbooks from the startup world, which is something called the minimum viable product. And it's a basic pr principle that Eric Rice wrote a book on called The Lean Startup. Uh, basically, it's just you always start and you build the least amount that you can, as quick as you can, for the least amount of money that you can, and you constantly iterate on that. And that's one of the reasons that we can move so quickly when we're building technology. So while I don't know entirely what it would look like, I challenge you to think about what a minimum viable policy approach would look like to try and keep pace with this very, very quickly evolving world. And the last point that I want to make today 
is one about how we actually went about building our company. So we started using a cloud service from Amazon. Formerly, you probably would have had to invest twenty to $30,000 to get a server up and running just to get started. We went and bought a third-party product called API.ai that we could put our data into to try and test the data models. We've since rebuilt that. I think in total we spent a few hundred dollars to get a very small product up, but that was enough to get us some interest from banks and to realize that we should continue going. And the implication from that, for me, from a policy perspective, is the most exciting because these types of companies should exist everywhere in the world. Technology and cost is not the barrier for entry anymore. And when Patrick and I were speaking about this earlier today, the question now is how do we create and facilitate ecosystems around the world so that companies like mine and like all the other panelists can exist everywhere and really be the drivers of economies. So I'm extremely excited about tech. I love getting to be in it. I think AI is going to bring really, really great changes. And our challenge is how do we build governance structures, policies, and systems that are nimble, innovative, and equitable. Thank you very much. <laughs>